Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for having me, John, and uh, thank you to everyone else. You know, I, I do think it's um, this is an important topic and something that whether we want to see these patients or not, we're going to see these patients. And so certainly it's something that we all have to think about. Um, let's see. All right. So when we're talking about building a construct and building a uh, uh, sort of a design for, for these patients, you know, if you're working with good sort of substrate, if you're working with good products, you really can build whatever the hell you want. But if you're working with warped wood, if you're working with sort of soft molded parts, you know, all of a sudden you can't build that house that you're looking for. And when we're talking about patients with good bone, it doesn't matter how many levels you're going up, up above or below because you really have something that you can grip into, you can grab onto, and that certainly makes your job as a surgeon much, much easier. But if you're trying to put together, you know, a big construct with, again, subpar materials, unfortunately, ultimately, it's going to wind up looking something like this. So we see that in the world of adult spinal deformity, there's certainly an association with osteoporosis. And there's conflicting evidence about whether the osteoporosis comes first and causes the deformity, or whether the deformity comes first and actually causes the osteoporosis. And we know that with poor bone quality, certainly the patients are predisposed to PJK, they're predisposed to screw pullouts, certainly lower rates of fusion, and it certainly takes longer for those bones to fuse. But most importantly, there's an increased rate of morbidity and mortality. And if we could minimize this, certainly it's something that uh, can really help our patients improve our outcomes. A couple of years ago, the ISSG published a paper that showed that uh, after adult spinal deformity, there really is a very high complication rate. Around one in four patients actually suffer some sort of complication. Fortunately, even patients who have these complications do very well. And we can look at that based on some of the, the uh, quality metrics and uh, the HRQL score. So, you know, if you take a look at the, uh, the factors that they found that actually affect outcome, there's a number of them, right? There's really something uh, out there that can really uh, change the game, so to speak. If we can affect some of these, we can really improve our patients' outcome, patients' outcomes. You know, when we look at this list, unfortunately, many of these factors are things that we can't necessarily change. But we should all keep an eye out for the low-hanging fruit and see if there's anything that we can do to try to improve our patients' outcomes. And so ultimately, what we're asking is, are we able to sufficiently optimize our patients? And again, I, I mentioned a second ago the low-hanging fruit. From my perspective, looking at patients and saying, hey, you know what, we have someone who smokes, vitamin D levels are a little bit low, if nutritionally, if they're uh, under or malnourished, and certainly their bone density plays a role. These are the, the, the things that I look for that I can certainly try to optimize the patient and, and hope to improve their outcomes. We see that smoking has a, a much higher rate of pseudoarthrosis, especially when we're talking about multi-level fusions. We know that smoking has a higher risk for infection. Patients who smoke have a higher risk of pseudoarthrosis, more adjacent segment disease. We know that patients with vitamin D deficiency, that's a predictor by, just by itself for non-union. And we can easily, easily supplement patients with vitamin D, even if we're just considering whether these patients should be uh, having surgery or not. There's this concept now of prehab, whether we can get our patients optimized nutritionally just by increasing their protein intake, get them optimized physically by having them go to physical therapy prior to their surgery, getting them functionally independent, having them lose weight if necessary prior to their procedure. We know that patients who are malnourished have a significantly higher complication rate just in lumbar spine surgery alone. But what about deformity patients? And so this is something that we actually can, can really uh, take advantage of and look at. And we know that from other fields of medicine, you know, patients uh, who have hip fractures, certainly they, you know, we can use uh, albumin as a marker to check their nutritional status. When it comes to deformity, we should be looking at this specifically. And so this is something that we did over here where we actually used the NISQIP database and looked at patients who had lumbar spine surgery and also had a diagnosis of osteoporosis. And we wanted to see how many of them had serum albumin levels over uh, the course of their hospital stay. And we found these patients. And what we found is that if you have a low serum albumin level, these patients are very prone to some bad, bad outcomes. And so higher rates of mortality, reoperation, readmission, 
Uh, and certainly, if you look at this long list of complications, you know, sepsis, septic shock, pulmonary embolism, the list kind of goes on and on about, you know, the, the increased morbidity and mortality just by having a patient who's malnourished. And these are patients who are, uh, again, adult deformity patients with osteoporosis. So in general, we kind of came to the conclusion that osteoporosis is really just a marker of medical frailty. And we should be watching out for it at every turn. We know that there's around the 10% incidence of degenerative scoliosis in these patients with osteoporosis. And that's not even considering patients who have kyphosis. Now, when we look through patients with adult deformity and we start to try to check their bone density, you, know, you can easily get fooled if your DEXA scans are just looking at the lumbar spine. And that's typically when we look at DEXA scans in general, the hip and the spine are the two places where people usually look. Unfortunately, though, when you start looking at uh, patients with adult spinal deformity, their spines are so um, uh, compressed down that a lot of times you actually get artifactually higher levels uh, of their bone density. And so we found that looking at the spine is not necessarily the best place. And so we looked at the data. And certainly in Japan, when they look at patients with osteoporosis, they found that the spine was certainly a good place to look, but we should also be looking perhaps at the distal radius, not just the femoral neck. And so in patients with adult spinal deformity, here we actually looked at our own patient population and found the osteoporotic patients with adult spinal deformity and tried to compare their T-scores at different sites. We found that the forearm actually had lower values than the hip in almost half the patients. We also found that the forearm made a diagnosis of osteoporosis in almost 20% of patients who had otherwise normal values. And so we as a policy now not only get DEXA scans of the hip and the, uh, the spine, but we also get the forearm specifically in our patients with adult spinal deformity. And here's a good example. This is a, T, a um, DEXA scan report of, uh, of a patient. You can notice that the T-score here for the hip and the T-score here for the femoral neck are essentially relatively, we'll say normal. This one is obviously osteopenic. This same patient, when we got the T-score from their distal radius, you can see all of a sudden that they're osteoporotic. And this is not a, an uncommon phenomenon. And so right now, we have the policy that not only do we include the forearm when we get testing for bone density, but we're actually very aggressive about treating. We treat anybody who has a T-score less than 2.0. Hi, Stu, this is uh, Ali, can I interrupt? Yeah. Yeah, I apologize. Well, uh, just uh, just a quick question about your last slide uh, sure. for for both for my own knowledge and for the audience. When you are treating based on a uh, on a T score, say from from the forearm, are you having any issues with getting approval uh, to initiate therapy? Uh, is anybody giving you a hard time about that? Or as long as you can demonstrate that there's osteoporosis anywhere. Uh, that uh, allows you to treat the patient with, I'm sure, some of the, some of the, some of the medications and drugs that you'll be discussing. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great question. So as long as you have osteoporosis demonstrated at some location, meaning the forearm is acceptable, then you can actually get them started with treatment. You know, it's yeah. um, the hard part is when you have, for example, if this patient had a T-score of minus 2.1 or minus 2.2, that's the gray area where you kind of need to be a little bit. Um, uh, sort of savvy as to how you document and how you dictate your notes in order to get them uh, approved for treatment. But as long as you have a T-score of minus 2.5 or lower, you can absolutely get them treated even in the forearm. Uh, Dr. Hirschman, do you mind yeah. if I just quickly interrupt for one quick question from the audience? Sure. Um, how long does it, and this may be in your um, talk, but how long does it typically take to get a meaningful improvement in bone density once you initiate treatment? So that's an excellent question. What we found actually, the Japanese studies have found is that it takes about 12 weeks on any one of the anabolics, meaning Timlos or teriparatide, um, you know, so that's abloparatide or teriparatide, uh, to, to see some sort of, we'll say, qualitative improvement in the bone density. In order to see a quantitative improvement in the bone density, meaning that you're now getting a new DEXA scan, it really lags behind by months. And so we don't recommend that. Uh, generally speaking, you, you won't see a quantitative improvement really even up to a year. So you would need to be, um, you'd need to really wait a very long time in order to see that. So after 12 weeks, there's a distinct qualitative improvement. A lot of that is based on the fact that the, the medications themselves actually improve uh, specific areas of the bone rather than others. And so when you look at the, the DEXA scans, you know, some of that is actually just picking up 
can't sell us bone alone, whereas we're more concerned about the cortical bone density, and these medications have a predilection to improving the cortical bone quality rather than the, uh, the cancellous bone initially. Dr. Hirschman, are you um, starting patients on treatment yourself or are you usually engaging endocrinologists or primary care doctors? So I'll say a little bit of both, but uh, one of my points of this talk is that we as spine surgeons need to own the bone. And so, you know, I used to send these patients out to endocrinology and unfortunately, Many of the endocrinologists, and through no fault of their own, they don't necessarily think the way that we're thinking. You know, from our perspective, we're trying to minimize complications, we're trying to minimize screw pullout, trying to improve fusion rates. From their perspective, they're trying to prevent a hip fracture. And so, you know, when they look at a patient, they say, oh, yeah, this patient has a T score of minus 2.7, but they don't have any other risk factors for fracture. We'll start them off on a bisphosphonate. Here's an oral, it's easier for them to take, it's cheaper, it certainly is a you know, it's easier to get approved by insurance. And then, you know, three months later, they come back to my office and say, oh yeah, this medication I'm taking, you know, it's really easy. I just take a pill every day. And unfortunately, that's, that's not what we're looking for. So because of the confusion that sometimes arises when we send patients to endocrinology or rheumatology, I've started just doing it myself. And I've been doing this now for um, five or six years, just ordering it myself. And once I get them initiated, then I send them off to rheumatology or endocrinology to continue following up. So uh, getting back to uh, uh, looking at different imaging modalities, I'm sure Wendy's going to have some comments on this one. I just found this really interesting. A couple of years ago, we looked at CT scans, trying to use Hounsfield units uh, to determine whether this can be a, a surrogate for looking at patients' bone density. And we found that this was, unfortunately, it does not suffice in patients with adult spinal deformity. We found that there was really very little correlation. And interestingly, this was one of my uh, colleagues' patients that he was about to operate on. And take a look at this CAT scan. It just looks like a regular CAT scan. And then the, uh, the Department of Radiology uh, happened to do a 3D reconstruction on this. And this patient had horrible bone density. I think it was a T-score of minus 3.2. And interestingly, when you look at the 3D reconstruction, you can really appreciate just how poor this patient's bone density really was. You can actually see really areas of gapping you know, within the bone. And so fortunately, Prior to surgery, this patient was optimized, uh, I think, on um, uh, teriparatide for six months prior to surgery. So we know that there are certain factors that can affect the outcome as far as osteopenia and osteoporosis are concerned. And unfortunately, you know, having a poor or a low bone mineral density will uh, uh, weaken the screw pullout strength. And so we see that you know, there are ways that we can try to improve our fixation in this poor quality bone. We can add more screws to the construct. We can use larger diameter screws. We can use longer screws. Placing our screws bicortically, using cement augmentation, if we medialize our screw trajectory, and if we avoid disruption of the dorsal cortex, all of these are tricks that we use as surgeons to try to improve the fixation in poor quality bone. But far and away, the most important factor is improving the bone quality, right? So as surgeons, as Koi uh, sort of um, segued for me, we, we really need to own the bone, right? We were trying to take this lousy, warped, wet wood and trying to turn it into these great two by fours. And so how can we really do that? Well, obviously there's lots of different medications out there that we can use to improve the bone density. Two of them specifically, teriparatide and avaloparatide, have been around now for several years. And these are some of the anabolics that we're referring to. And this is, uh, uh, these types of medications are the, the medications that we're really looking to get our patients on because that's going to move the needle far more significantly than the bisphosphonates or some of the other medications that uh, inhibit um, osteoclast activity. So we see that certainly there are medications like teriparatide and avaloparatide. Both of them are anabolic medications. They're both recombinant human parathyroid hormone. And with these agents, they're incredibly safe medication. Uh, but there's a black box warning on both about a theoretical risk of osteosarcoma. That risk is actually theoretical only in that when these studies were done, these studies were actually done on rats and rat bones are different than human bones in that rats will grow for the entire um, duration of their life. So a, a, a big rat is an old rat, right? Whereas with humans, our bones stop growing once we reach skeletal maturity at puberty, 
rat bones will continue to grow. And so they have very active osteoblasts at the ends of their, essentially in their epiphyses, which will continue to grow. And so we don't use these medications. We don't use anabolic agents in children for this reason, because that really would increase the risk of osteosarcoma, which is something we don't see uh, in a mature, skeletally mature adult. So uh, before someone was asking whether I do this myself, and when I see patients with osteoporosis and I want to get them started on these medications, I order a series of labs. And those labs that I order, vitamin D, calcium, parathyroid hormone, alkaline phosphatase. And then in my practice, I also order serum albumin. And in males, I will order testosterone. And really what I'm looking for is why are these patients osteoporotic? Do they have some sort of uh, medical problem that's predisposing them to have poor bone density? And the four, the four labs that are up here are required before you can prescribe these other medications just to make sure that we're not uh, putting patients in harm's way. So when we look at these medications, really what we're looking for, low vitamin D is not going to change anything, but you know, these medications can make patients hypercalcemic. And so we want to make sure that you know, these patients have normal calcium levels. If a patient has very elevated parathyroid hormone levels, that could be a sign of a parathyroid adenoma. And you may want to order or send them to endocrinology, but uh, I will order a syntogram looking for a, a parathyroid adenoma. Alkaline phosphatase is to rule out pagets. Uh, obviously, if you have a patient with a fresh fracture, for example, someone who just comes into your office with a new compression fracture of the spine, the alkaline phosphatase can be a little bit elevated, and that would not be a contraindication to starting medication. Again, we, when we're talking about optimizing patients, we want to make sure that, they're pa that our patients are really being optimized from every different angle. And so nutritionally, you know, patients who are osteoporotic are in a catabolic state. And so by getting them into an anabolic state and making sure that they're anabolic by having their albumin levels uh, being at an appropriate level, we can really minimize risk. And same with testosterone levels as far as bone density is concerned in males. When you look at the studies, we find that the uh, teriparatide versus some of the other bisphosphonates has significantly improved uh, outcomes as res with respect to adjacent seven fractures, with uh, respect to pseudoarthrosis, and certainly implant failure. Uh, we also found that teriparatide was associated with improved outcomes and less pain. Other studies have shown similar things where uh, certainly teriparatide had higher rates of bone fusion, and this was assessed by CT scan. Uh, longer dosing of, of teriparatide was associated with higher rates of fusion. And someone before asked how long we use it. You know, we place our patients on teriparatide for a minimum of three months prior to surgery. And then I should say, when I say uh, teriparatide or abiloparatide, both these medications are used three months prior to surgery. And then for the, <clears throat> pardon me, the entire duration of the rest of treatment. For abiloparatide, that's a total of 18 months. And for teriparatide, that's a total of 24 months. And keeping med patients on those medications will not only improve fusion rates, but also have been uh, shown to improve overall outcomes. And so that's really what we're trying to, to find in these patients. Uh, by the way, we don't have studies yet for adult spinal deformity. These are all studies that are extrapolated from lumbar spine fusions, usually single and two-level fusions. Here's another study, again, out of Japan, looking at teriparatide versus bisphosphonates and control groups. And teriparatide was shown to have significantly lower rates of screw pullout. So again, trying to minimize our complication rate just by using medications. Uh, the newest anabolic agent out there is a monoclonal antibody to sclerostomy. That's a, a medication called Ivenity. And this is both anabolic and anti-catabolic or anti-resorptive. The problem with this medication is a couple of issues with it. I will tell you that I think it's a wonderful medication. We don't have any real data on it certainly no data on um, uh, spine surgery. This medication was only approved about six months ago by the FDA. The, the issue with this is that there's an increased rate of stroke and heart attack in patients who are on this medication. And so contraindications to uh, ebenity usage is any sort of uh, myocardial infarction or stroke in the past 12 months. If someone is high risk for those pathologies, then certainly this would not be a medication that we would want our patients on. Another issue is that you can actually drop the calcium levels by taking uh, the uh, uh, Evendity medication. 
and uh, you're also prone to some of the same complications that we see with the bisphosphonates, particularly avian of the jaw and atypical femur fractures. So as far as, uh, before we get to the case, as far as uh, you know, take home points from our optimization is concerned, you know, we know that patients with degenerative scoliosis have a very high rate of also having osteoporosis. And so looking forward in all of these patients is key. Even though someone may have a T-score that's normal in the spine, we really need to look at other parts of the body to make sure that we're not missing a diagnosis of osteoporosis. We also know that non-operative management, unfortunately, does not really work very well in patients with adult spinal deformity. And so surgical outcomes really need to be uh, looked at and critically sort of um, uh, uh, critiqued in order to try to get these patients to have uh, an improved quality of life. We know that our elderly patients have a higher risk of complications, but fortunately, they also usually have a disproportionately greater improvement following surgery. We know that adult spinal deformity is rarely emergent, so take the time to optimize your patients, make sure you're ordering appropriate lab work, look at your patients, you know, not just from the spine perspective, but from a global health perspective, and really try to minimize their risk for of complications following surgery. And lastly, for, from my perspective, uh, I would tell you that improving bone density with anabolics really does result in superior surgical outcomes. We've seen this in a number of different studies and uh, lowering our patient's uh, rate of complications will absolutely improve our patient outcomes in the, in the long term. So, you know, taking the time to optimize patients is key and critical. So I have a uh, three cases. Of Joe, I apologize. Can I can I just uh, ask a quick question on your yeah. points? Uh, sorry for yeah, uh, no. interrupting. The uh, do you have is it case by case or do you have or do you go by an absolute number, say two point five or or higher? If a, pa if a patient comes in with that, you're definitely pre-treating them, or it, I mean, barring an emergency, of course. Are you using rigid uh, a rigid algorithm, uh, a rigid uh, T score? Or before you send them for treatment? So, so I will uh, I will treat anyone who has a T-score of minus 2.0 or lower. Um, so if they have a T-score of minus 2.5, it makes my job very easy. If they have a T-score of minus 2.2, it gets a little complicated because all of a sudden I have I may have some difficulty trying to get the, the anabolic medications approved. Uh, but if someone has a low T-score and we are talking, we're not talking about single-level fusion, two-level fusion, which, by the way, these patients are at increased risk of complications there as well. But for spinal deformity surgery, where the complication risk is very high, <coughs> pardon me, we know that for a fact that minimizing the risk by improving their bone density is really paramount. You know, so uh, why toy around with it? Why wait for something bad to happen? You know, I would say nip these patients in the butt. By uh, by improving their bone density right off the bat, right when you see them. Got it. Got it. You know, no, that makes sense. Uh, I appreciate that because that's that's really uh, I think a lot of us here, and I'm sure a lot in the audience will will agree. Probably a lot of us do that. You know, 2.0 and 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 below, you're going to send them for three months of treatment before you offer surgery. Uh, uh, 2.5 definitely, but for most patients, it's going to be about 2.0. Uh, I'll actually go one step further, and and I, I tell my patients, you know. We're all doctors, and obviously, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon, we really like to try to avoid medicine altogether. As neurosurgeons, you know, certainly, uh, you know, there are uh, focuses that uh, that you you guys will look at far more than the medical issues. But you know, as doctors, we should just be trying to optimize the health of our patients. And if we find someone who has a T score, for example, minus two point two or minus two point three, even if they're not surgical candidates for a number of other reasons. These people should be started on medication before they get another problem. And so I, I really try to capture these patients, you know, even if it's not me being the person to prescribe it, but sending them to the rheumatologist, sending them to the endocrinologist to make sure that they're being treated adequately and hopefully can avoid other problems in the future, even if it's not uh, directly affecting me and my spine practice. Hey, so, Steve, I have a question for you, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course, yeah. Um, so you uh, talked a little bit about uh, PJK. Um, do, does your preventative strategy uh, differ based on the patient's sort of baseline bone quality or kind of what's your algorithm for that? And so the answer is no. Um, I'm still trying to, I'm going to put a little spin on that. So I still try to uh, hit target numbers as far as gap score is concerned. 
I do also look at age appropriate values and I try to, to dial people in to a certain, um, uh, to certain parameters. That being said, you know, the only way that I would differ my approach as far as PJK is concerned is I would have a lower threshold to extend my, my fusion higher up in a patient who has a very poor bone density. Um, you know, and really just spreading the force out over more levels is my rationale. Uh, I don't specifically try to uh, do anything differently for patients who have poor bone density as far as reducing PJK. You know, PJK, we, you know, it's the holy grail as far as deformity surgery is concerned. And we really don't know, you know, all the factors that will lead to, um, to somebody getting a failure or a kyphosis. And uh, I think right now hitting the numbers that we need to hit is probably our best guess at avoiding PJK. And what's your preventative strategy of choice? As far as uh, reducing PJK? Yeah, like band, I, I, try, I, try to, I try to get uh, patients balanced. That's my, that's my strategy. Okay, uh, I guess what I'm asking is, are you doing like the UIV plus one cement or the sublaminar bands or? No, I, I get them balanced according to the GAP score. I do nothing at the top different in patients who have uh, poor bone density versus patients who have good bone density. The one, uh, I'll put a little spin on that saying that in a patient with poor bone density, I make their bone density good before I operate on them. And that, that's, the, that's the key here. You know, we should not be operating on patients with, with lousy bone density. It's, it's asking for, uh, for failure. So getting to this first case, this is a, we're going to start off with a sort of like a, a simpler case and get into a, a people who are a little bit more complicated. So a 59-year-old female with low back pain, she's had it for a couple of years, worsening posture, T-score of minus 2.8. Uh, so these are her standing films. And I, I'll zoom in on the next uh, image. We'll zoom in on the, uh, the spine itself. But we see that this lady has, she's overall fairly well balanced. You know, she's uh, recruiting some of her mechanisms to try to get that way. So we see that she's extending her thoracic spine a little bit. She's retroverting her pelvis just a little, but certainly nothing terrible. Uh, again, she's coronally balanced. She's sagittally balanced. But she's complaining of fatigue and she's complaining of pain. So if we take a look at her spine a little bit closer, right, we see that she does have some retroversion of the pelvis. She has this coronal imbalance around the thoracolumbar junction. She definitely has some kyphosis across the thoracolumbar junction. Uh, when we look at the thoracic spine, we see that it's relatively hypokyphotic. We see that her lumbar spine is hypolordotic. And so she definitely has some issues going on, which would explain her pain. So uh, I'm going to kind of Poll the audience, so to speak. So is this patient a patient who's a surgical candidate? Are there considerations that we're looking for? Is there anyone who would have a concern and say, maybe this is someone we shouldn't be touching? Can we go back to the pictures? Uh... Yeah, sure, sure. And if, are there any other concerns? Are there things that you know people would say, oh, you know, uh, this is something um, something we should really be looking for. We should be looking looking for X, Y, Z instead. Uh, I, by the way, I will apologize to everyone and tell you that I, I don't have many MRI cuts on um, on. I, have, I think I have it on my my second case. I have one or two cuts, but on these patients, I can tell you that uh, she has some foraminal stenosis at the fractional curve, but centrally everything is pretty wide open. She has some foraminal stenosis on the contralateral side. By the way, I always like to, when I place these x-rays up, I look, place them the way I'll be looking at them in the operating room. So left side on the left side, uh, my mentor, uh, or say mentors, Keith Bridwell and Larry Lanky, this is how they did it, and so this is how I do it. And um, you know, I want this case to be like an old friend when I get into the operating room. So looking at it, the way that you're gonna see it on the operating room table is something that I always do and, and would recommend to others as well. So uh, concerns, I mean, is anyone concerned about the T-score of minus 2.8? Hey, Stu, it's Coy. I'll, I'll go first. Yeah, so I think, you know, this patient has um, uh, pain symptoms uh, and pretty significant scoli there, probably, what, 40 or 50 degrees. 
Um, you know, obviously needs some other workup like a MRI, which you alluded to, CT scan, et cetera, but um, certainly before um, treatment, which at first glance looks like probably a, um, probably a low thoracic to, to pelvic fusion. Uh, obviously would want to treat um, her um, uh, osteoporosis uh, prior to undergoing such a big undertaking. Yeah. So actually, uh, Corey, you brought up a very good point. I agree with you that looking at this just on paper, I would say low thoracic to uh, pelvic fusion. The the one thing I tell all of these patients, you know, I hope that that's what we're going to be able to do. But if I get into the operating room and I find that your bone density is not that good, that buys you a longer fusion. And the reason is just to try to spread out those forces, try to minimize the risk of, uh, uh, of pull out at the top and try to minimize the risk of ultimately PJK and PJF. And certainly there are strategies that we, that we can use, like someone brought up before, cement augmentation. You know, and we could go UIV, UIV plus one, UIV plus two. The problem is we're really trying to throw stuff at it and pretend that it's no longer osteoporotic. And the way that I look at this, if we are able to optimize our bone density, we should be able to, to do this and have it be a, a T10 to pelvis, for example, and should, we wouldn't necessarily have to worry. But if we get in there and all of a sudden, you know, the, the bone density is really pretty poor, cementing a screw is a bailout. That's a, that's a salvage, you know. We should not be using salvage on a primary surgery trying to accomplish a, a smaller fusion, you know. It's a, this is a patient who, we didn't create this problem, we're, we're just handed this problem. And really we're trying to now minimize uh, our risk and mitigate the, uh, the possible outcomes or actually mitigate the possible complications, which could compromise our outcomes. So I always, I agree with you. I would say T10 to pelvis, but I'll reserve the right to go higher. Any other concerns that people have? Yeah, hi, it's Judas Ali. Um, so uh, obviously the, uh, you know, the osteoporosis, osteopenia osteoporosis um, is a consideration. Her medical fitness for surgery, cardiopulmonary wise, et cetera. Um, but I, I'm going to put on kind of my neuro, my general neurosurgery hat, if you will. My general neurosurgery hat, um, and I know I, I certainly have a lot of uh, colleagues who would say, um, "What are we? What's the goal of treatment here?" Um, obviously, structurally, you're right. A G10 to pelvis or something like that will probably fix her uh, X-ray. Uh, but when you evaluate a patient like this, what metrics are you looking at? What symptoms are you looking at to for you to decide whether you're going to operate or not? Because every one of these patients is going sure. to have back pain. So yeah. can you help us in the audience? And what what are the what are the flags that tell you, you know, barring neurological issues, okay, I think I can help this patient that is coming to me with back pain. So uh, that's actually an outstanding question. Uh, so I say two things to my patients, every patient. So first and foremost, you know, this is a mechanical problem, right? So we know that when people have this uh, uh, sort of uh, coronal and sagittal imbalance, it's a structural deformity. And many of these people will say that, you know, yeah, actually, when I lie down, I feel much better, you know. And I ask patients, how do you feel when you're lying down? Is that a position of comfort? Uh, many of these patients will also report that if they do aqua therapy, they feel great. And I tell them, yeah, if we could have you move to the moon or live underwater, we would not be having this discussion. But since they are living on Earth and they're forced to deal with gravity, you know, this is a problem that they're going to have to face. And so I say to them, how miserable are you? And I use that word because this is a great surgery if people are miserable. If they're not miserable, my advice is to wait until they are. And many of the patients come to me I would say even a year or two before they uh, they actually needed surgery, you know. And when they come to me, oh yeah, I've got this back pain, it's hurting. You know that that patient is not a good candidate for surgery. You know, it's the patient who is absolutely miserable. And when the patients are miserable, they're going to love you after surgery. They're going to do great because realistically, we're not taking people who have 10 out of 10 pain and bringing them to zero out of 10 pain or even one out of 10. What I tell people is that. I could take you from an eight or a nine and bring you down to a three, maybe even a four. And if that's going to be okay, then they'd be a good candidate for surgery. But if they're looking for the home run and to try to feel the way that they felt when they were 30, that's probably not in the cards. And so I think that that's a very key sort of thing to make sure that patients' expectations are managed 
But more so than anything, these are big surgeries that are riddled with complications and have, for lack of a better term, some subpar outcomes in many of our patients. And so patients who are miserable are going to love you after surgery. But if they're not miserable, they may not be happy with some of the outcomes that they get. So, you know, certainly we talked about some of these problems. Oh, we talked about some of these problems and, you know, I uh, went a little bit too quickly there. Sorry about that. But, uh, you know, when we take a look at these patients, this was someone who I planned on doing a T10 to pelvis. And when I got in there, despite having uh, a uh, three plus months of teriparatide, her bone density was not where I wanted it to be. And when I say where I wanted it to be, personally, I like what I refer to as audible purchase. When we're placing the screws, when you hear that, you know, crack, 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 crack of the screw with each turn, the, the high insertional torque, that's what really I'm looking for. And I know that we're, if I can get that, I can put the spine wherever I want it to be. But if I can't get that, you know, all of a sudden I'm dealing with the potential of loosening and windshield wiping once this patient stands up. And so I think we got a nice correction on this patient. Certainly when you look at the pelvis, we see that she's, you know, standing with a much more antiverted pelvis. Again, I, I look to the gap score to try to dial in uh, my appropriate lower doses at the lower lumbar spine. And uh, this is a, uh, you know, someone asked before about PJK. One of uh, my mentors, Keith Bridwell, liked to use a, a screw on one side and a hook on the other. And the rationale behind that is that you have two modes of failure. One is a pullout, the other is flexion. And so by having two separate modes of failure, there's the potential to reduce uh, PJK. And certainly I know that actually some of the guys at Rush published a study not too long ago looking at having hooks at the top of your construct and whether that reduced PJK and they found some, uh, some good results with that as well. So this, I think that this patient, I mean, she ended up doing uh, wonderfully well and we were happy with her correction. Uh, and so certainly this was one that I, I feel like we've, we've gotten away with um, uh, having a, a good solid construct in a patient with suboptimal bone quality. And again, I keep the patients on their the uh, teriparatide or abloparatide for the duration of treatment, which again would be either be 24 months for teriparatide or 18 months for abloparatide. Um, moving on to the second case that I do, I know we're you know, trying to move things along. So here's a patient. I think we just had, I'm sorry, uh, jo uh, Jonathan, are, was there one or two questions from the, uh, from the chat box? Um, uh, <clears throat> actually, there are a couple of questions about um, how BMI factors into this. Yeah. And, and um, would you consider a brace on this patient either pre or post, uh, I assume post-operatively? So uh, I'll answer the second question first. So Bracing has not been shown to improve outcomes at all. I think it's um, just really makes patients feel uncomfortable. If that, if I'm really very concerned about a PJK, if somebody's uh, leaning forward, you know, some of these patients, because their brain is so used to leaning forward, if they're uh, significantly saturally imbalanced, sometimes I will put a brace on them just to, to act as a positive feedback, as a reminder to help them stand up straight. But the brace itself is really not doing much. It's really just providing feedback for the biofeedback. As far as BMI is concerned, you know, most of the time, patients with a high BMI are not osteoporotic. So we don't really worry about those patients terribly. The caveat to that is patients who have been taking uh, high doses of steroids for prolonged periods of time. Just so that you guys know, if a patient has a T-score of less than minus 2.0 and it's glucocorticoid induced, that is a, a reason to document on your, in your note and you can get them authorized for teriparatide not abloparatide, but teriparatide is FDA approved for glucocorticoid induced uh, osteoporosis in patients with a T-score of minus 2.0 or worse. So that certainly will suffice. But generally speaking, patients with a high BMI are not osteoporotic. If this patient was osteoporotic as a result of um, uh, glucocorticoid usage, I would probably have, uh, have them try to lose weight or again, be much more, uh, have a lower threshold to use a very long construct in order to uh, prevent screw pullout and to spread my force out across the uh, across the construct itself. Were there uh, other questions? I think that's it for now. So moving along to case two, it's a bit of a similar scenario, but this lady, a uh, 66-year-old lady, she's been having some pain for four years. 
she actually has a history of malignant thyroid cancer. And this kind of changes things a little bit, right? So all of a sudden, you know, we have some concerns now perhaps about some of the medications that we may want to use. So here's this lady's EOS images, right? We see that she has, uh, again, a coronal imbalance. She has a truncal shift. Uh, she's very, you can see skeletally, she's very frail in appearance. Uh, hypokyphotic thoracic spine, hypolordotic lumbar spine. Uh, maybe we'll call it a neutral uh, amount of lordosis across the uh, uh, thoracolumbar junction, but you know, not exactly normal. She's retroverting her pelvis. Again, sagittally balanced, coronally balanced. She's kind of doing the best that she can with her condition. You know, what are our, what are our concerns here? What, what are we kind of thinking about for this lady? By the way, I'll let you know also that uh, foraminal stenosis on the concavity of the fractional curve, foraminal stenosis, again, where the, uh, where the curve uh, takes off into the lumbar spine. Yes, yeah, so Ali, I, I'll, I'll go first. I, I think the, uh, you know, this patient's a little bit different. Now we're dealing with potentially, you know, oncological issue. We're, taking, we're, uh, we're considering prognosis, survivability. Um, is three to six months of uh, recovery from this operation worth it for her or not? Yep. Um, she appears to be quite thin. So now we're talking about nutritional status and albumin. Um, I don't know if this is going to be that right patient. I, I'm not sure this is your classic adult degenerative deformity patient. Sure. Just, sure. In, just from the data that you've shown. Right. You know, so I, I agree with all of that. And so um, this lady, the first thing when she came to me, and I, you know, I tell patients, I never want to say no, but I frequently say not yet. Right. And so when patients come to me, you know, and this lady was really, I mean, she is a terrible candidate for surgery. She had multiple issues going on, as you alluded to, you know, so first and foremost, her survivability. So we, you know, consulted with her oncologist and said, hey, what's the story here? And he actually said she was in remission and looking good. And so certainly that's not something that we were concerned about. We looked at her serum albumin. She was, you know, had a, a very poor, low serum albumin. And so we said, first and foremost, we got to get you nutritionally sound. Uh, we spoke to her endocrinologist and said, hey, you know, she had this thyroid tumor. Uh, is this really going to be an issue as far as medication is concerned? And, you know, from a teriparatide and abloparatide perspective, that's, you know, having a thyroid tumor is not a contraindication for using those medications. Having a parathyroid tumor would be, right? So we spoke to the endocrinologist and he said, actually, believe it or not, we can get away with, with using teriparatide in this lady. And that's what we did. And we actually uh, ended up using teriparatide for six months, not in preparation for her surgery, but just to get her healthier because her T-score was minus 3.2. So we, we had this really very sick lady. And we said, hey, you know what? This is someone who, who really needs treatment. And again, as a spine surgeon, keep in mind that yes, we're looking to an eye or with an eye to their spine, but we really need to, to remember that this patient is a walking individual with multiple medical problems. And if we can stave something, stave off a problem in the future, we may as well uh, get on that and, and help to do that. So this is a lady, again, multiple medical issues, multiple concerns, right? This is her MRI. And I just pointed this out for one one reason. So we see that she has some foraminal stenosis down here, but look at these pedicles. I mean, these were tiny pedicles, tiny pedicles up and down her spine, just like this. And you know that, you know, pedicle screws gain their purchase in the pedicles, right? That's where they gain their purchase. And so this may be someone who we say, you know what, this may be a, a really terrible candidate for surgery. Uh, so, you know, this is, uh, these are all things that you need to consider before taking people to the operating room and, uh, and saying, you know what, this is, uh, this is a way to, to minimize uh, complications and mitigate risk. And so is there anyone who, when you take a look at this, you know, is she a candidate for surgery? Um, is this someone who you'd say maybe just uh, maybe not a good candidate? Any uh, thoughts or questions? Let's see, let's get some of our uh, faculty co-hosts involved. Uh, Jonathan or Griffin, uh, what, do, what do you guys think? 
no question she's definitely a candidate for surgery and uh, you know I think uh, one point that I wanted to make I was going to wait until the end but uh, Ali called on me but you know I think uh, we have very similar training backgrounds obviously Stu by uh, by sort of doing the same fellowship with a lot of the same mentors but you know spinal deformity I think is the one area where you absolutely have to have these patient reported outcome measures and uh, you know the biggest takeaway for me was uh, the comparison on some of these where you can actually compare spine patients and spine deformity patients to patients with other medical problems and you know really from a disability standpoint you know you can compare some of these uh, spinal deformity patients to patients who are walking around with a heart transplant or a lung transplant or you know just a, a level of disability that is really unmatched uh, by any amount of what their imaging would show and so I mean, to Ali's point, yes, you're right. I mean, they may be complaining of back pain or leg pain at the fractional curve, but that's not the whole story. Um, and, you know, there's certainly the mental health scores that goes, go into it, the, the body appearance scores that go into it. And there was actually a great point that was made in the chat box about, you know, this sort of feed-forward effect of the patients are depressed by their appearance, so then they gain weight, and then they can't exercise, and they get more depressed, and they get more disabled. So, in a lot of ways, yes, absolutely, I think she's a candidate, but she has to be, you know, well-optimized, which obviously is the whole point of your talk. So I guess uh, I'm, I'm, I'll take the check whenever you're, uh, you're, uh, you're willing. And Griffin's referring to probably one of my uh, favorite uh, papers ever, which was uh, written by uh, some of my colleagues in the ISSG, but essentially I uh, found that patients with a severe thoracolumbar um, deformity, like the ones you've been showing, have a quality of life score is actually worse than uh, people who are amputees, yeah. than people who are blind. Yeah. Uh, so Griffin's uh, spot on there. Yeah. You know, I, I'm glad you brought that up, Griffin. And I remember, um, you know, uh, Larry Lanky, our mentor, you know, he, um, he would frequently say, and actually this is case number three, I remember uh, uh, hearing his voice when I was looking at this patient. You know, for many of these patients, and not necessarily for this lady, but for many of these patients, we know the outcome if we did nothing, you know, we, we know the outcome for these people if we do nothing. And so giving them a chance at having success, giving them a chance at getting them back to a normal existence or a happier life is really the, the goal that we're really trying to achieve here. And we're really in the business, not of saving lives per se, but of saving quality of life, you know. And, you know, this lady particularly, obviously lots of things could go wrong, but we could fix a lot of the problems that are going on medically to get her to the point where it becomes safe surgically. And that's the goal of this talk, and that's really what I want to kind of, you know, uh, bring home to everyone when we're looking at these uh, adult spinal deformity patients, specifically with osteoporosis. So we optimized this patient. It took uh, about nine months to do so, and we took her to the OR. And, you know, this is actually her uh, sort of her path as far as bone density is concerned. You can see that she kind of has been on multiple different medications and ultimately she got to minus 3.2, but we started her, uh, the last bone density of the hip was minus 2.7, the forearm was minus 3.2. And uh, we got her started on Orteo and ultimately we got her albumin up. Uh, and this is one of these ladies, by the way, she became hypercalcemic. And so we got her on Forteo on an every other day schedule to try to boost her. And we got her on Forteo for, again, a number of months, I believe it was six months prior to surgery just to optimize her. And so we got her properly optimized and we took her to the operating room. And after six months of Forteo, this lady's bone density was surprisingly good, surprisingly good, qualitatively, qualitatively. So in the operating room, I actually made the decision that we could stop in the distal thoracic spine rather than going higher up, which I was very ready to do uh, and make sure that uh, we were able to get a good, good fixation. One other thing that I didn't mention in these patients who are really very skinny, you know, some of these patients who are, in fact, cachectic when you first see them, you know, they're terrible candidates, not only medically, but, you know, if you were to put instrumentation in, it would be breaking down before you knew it because it's up against the skin. And that's something to consider. So I always palpate the, the spinous processes of these patients, make sure that I'm not actually palpating, the, you know, the transverse processes as it comes up. Uh, you know, if you can do that, I mean, that's, there's no plastic surgery in the world that would give you a soft tissue envelope that makes it safe. And so there are patients who I, I tell them, go home, eat your favorite foods, uh, eat as much ice cream as you want. We really need to get these people uh, essentially heartier and healthier and put on some mass 
before you can take these people to the operating room safely. And so again, this lady, uh, we took her to the OR, we got uh, a pretty good outcome and we were pretty happy with that. Uh, and she's actually been doing very well overall. And uh, we've really been pretty pleased with, uh, with the fact that we were able to prevent and uh, uh, prevent a bunch of the complications and improve her outcomes to, uh, to a significant degree. Hey, Stu, can you go back one slide? Sure, sure. Uh, can you tell us what we're looking at at the top of the construct no, there? For the AP yeah, here? That's a, um, that is a device that uh, it's an interlaminar clamp. It's not an interspinous process clamp. It's an interlaminar clamp that we were actually trialing uh, at one point to see if this would help reduce proximal junctional kyphosis. And we did not see any significant benefits, but this was the lady, this was a lady who was enrolled in that trial uh, and did not, um, again, we, the device itself was not something that we found to be particularly effective, but uh, she was one of the people who got it. So case number three, I have this 67 year old male. I used to be um, in private practice before joining at MGH. And uh, this was a gentleman who came to me while I was uh, in private practice. And so 67 year old male with increasing low back pain and severely worsening posture over just the past several months. Okay, so that's key. Severely worsening posture over the past several months. He was already seen by several doctors, but when I saw him, I said something else is going on, we need to send you to neurology. And I thought that he had some sort of Parkinsonian condition. And unfortunately the neurologist came back with what a, exactly what I expected with a, not Parkinson's, but might be a Parkinson-like condition. Uh, otherwise, this gentleman is in good health. He's surprisingly functional given his uh, significant deformity and walks around his neighborhood daily. And so here we have, on the left is an AP, and on the right is a lateral. All right, so this is a lateral x-ray. Here's our AP. And so we have, this is November 2015. You know, this guy who's just kind of leaning to one side, leaning to one side, all right? So I said, listen, you know, let's get your bone density checks. Clearly it was, there was something going on and uh, T-score of mice 3.0. I said, look, we need to get you on some sort of powerful an anabolic agent since we started him on Forteo. And I said, we're gonna put you on Forteo for as long as we possibly can. We put him on for six months and he came back to me in April. And, um, you know, again, before we get into considerations for surgery as a candidate, you know, this was his April x-ray. This is an AP. This is a lateral. And notice that we're looking at a giant humeral head over here. It's only giants because of projection. So he's leaning so close to the beam that uh, it's just literally projecting. It's not a uh, hypertrophic uh, deformity of the upper extremity. This is a uh, an individual who's leaning towards the screen. So, what do we think? Is this guy a candidate for surgery? What are we worried about? What sort of considerations? So, one, uh, I'll just add my two cents on these. Um, believe it or not. Um, uh, for adult deformity patients, the Parkinsonian patient gives me sort of the same heebie-jeebies uh, yeah. that I would get in the sort of young uh, neuromuscular patient, uh, where sure. you're just like, oh, this is this is probably not going to go well. Um, and so this is definitely a case. You know, I'm I'm not sure what you decided to do with this, but uh, this is something that if you're going to do it, you're going to have to go really big. And knowing that maybe you know. Now, his not Parkinson's, but sort of Parkinson's-like syndrome is uh, definitely going to limit his recovery for, for sure. Yeah, so that's a great point. So, you know, this is the type of patient that really scares the hell out of me because these patients all have some degree of camptochormia. And that's going to, literally, they are going to challenge your construct as, as every day, uh, as if it's their job, you know. Uh, they're going to try to pull away from the, those screws and rods uh, really every minute of every day that they are standing up or sitting up. <clears throat> so we really have to consider, you know, this is a guy who, even if their deformity was just down here, this is someone who, as Griffin pointed out, we really need to think big. You know, 
And the question then becomes, you know, just how big? Do we take this guy up to T4? Do we take him up to T2? Do we take him up to C5? Do we take him to C2? Do we bring him right up to the ox foot? Do we give him a chance to fail any of those? And so these are all things that we need to consider prior to taking people to surgery. And I remember, again, uh, you know, Larry's voice echoed in my head when I met this individual and saw him again in April, that we know what the outcome is going to be for this gentleman if we did nothing. You know, this guy became really sedentary, non-functional, and became a setup for some of the other medical complications like DVT, like PE, like pneumonia, like uh, sacral decubit eye ulcers. You know, so these are things that we really worry about in patients who really just become uh, dysfunctional or non-functional. I also want to point out, just take a look at this gentleman's ribs relative to his pelvis. I mean, he is really leaning off to the side. And so when I'm evaluating these patients, one thing that I always do, uh, and I, I get this on all my patients, but I lie my patients down and I take an x-ray of them in, either in the supine or prone position. And so this is a gentleman who I lie him down prone. And look at how flexible that curve really is, right? Look at how nicely uh, sort of, uh, I don't want to say corrected this gentleman looks, but he definitely comes back from where he was a significant amount. We see that on the lateral. The lateral certainly shows uh, it's a little bit clearer now. We see that there are new compression where these compression fractures at L1, L2, and L3. This is despite this gentleman being on uh, teroparotide for several months. And so at this point, we, we basically said, you know, what can we do for this guy? You know, is there anything we can do? Is there anything we should do? Should we really avoid this gentleman? Should we just kind of let him deteriorate, continue to deteriorate? This is a gentleman in his 60s. Uh, or do we intervene and try to give this gentleman uh, the best chance of success while minimizing risk and trying to maximize our outcome? And so, again, we optimize this gentleman. We check his serum albumin levels. We checked his testosterone. His testosterone happened to be low. We sent him to urology and got that optimized. Uh, his albumin was also low. We started him on a nutritional plan, and we had him on Forteo for, I believe, six months prior to surgery, maybe even a little bit longer than that. When we got into the operating room for this gentleman, again, we found that they were fantastic uh, or much better bone density than we had thought. But again, you have to go long in these people. You have to think big in these people. Obviously, this guy is not corrected to the uh, to GAP scores. GAP actually wasn't out at this time, so we didn't have GAP to use as a helpful tool. But you know, you can see that he's hypolordotic through the lumbar spine. And this was somebody who, when I was doing my correction, I did not want to pull on. You know, we have lots of screws, lots of points of fixation, but we really don't want to try to really pull the spine back and put him into a, into a position where we're setting him up to fail. We also have to think about the fact that he is going to pull out or at least pull forward uh, as a result of cantacormia. And so the fact that he's going to be leaning forward, really, we just kind of want to leave him almost a little bit forward just to try and prevent some of the pullout that may occur if we were to put him back into a uh, perfectly lordotic and anatomic uh, alignment. So, you know, keeping these things in mind is really critical when we're, when we're addressing some of these complicated problems within spinal deformity. And again, this is a gentleman who I told, you know, I told him time and time again, this may not be his last surgery. You know, he needs to recognize that we may ultimately have to go up to C5, C2, or the occiput at some point in the future, just to make sure that he is able to maintain uh, an appropriate sagittal alignment and appropriate sagittal balance. Stu, just out of uh, curiosity, did you do the, uh, the Dan Rue, uh, I left the, the rods long for you, so when you have to come back and <laughs> No, that was, um, that was uh, I guess, a little bit by accident. You know, when I get up to the top there after placing uh, this many screws, you know, I uh, getting in there with a big bolt cutter or taking out the rod to try to cut it again uh, or trying to shimmy it down becomes somewhat problematic. And I find that I, um, I was doing more damage to the soft tissue. Personally, I feel that protecting the soft tissue envelope at the very top of the construct is critical to helping maintain the integrity of, of, uh, of the construct and preventing PJK. And that's just my own personal belief. And so uh, cutting into that muscle, cutting into that soft tissue to try to get the, the rod back out and, and to get it, uh, uh, the bolt cutter in there is, uh, I find more traumatic, does more damage 
and leaving the rod perhaps a little longer than I'd like. I agree with you. It, it's a, it's not the sexiest looking x-ray. Well, I just, uh, I bring it up because we had Dan uh, here a, a couple weeks ago and there's, there's so many fantastic uh, Dan Rue aphorisms from the OR, but the best is Monday morning conference when he's done a big, long front back. And uh, as some of you guys may know, Dan Rue only does cervical spine. And so uh, he'll make a point every Monday morning of saying, don't worry, Larry, I left the rods long for you. So if you need to, you know, latch onto them, you can. Yeah. 